chow are a lot. When you consider everything that goes into raising an ideal chow, its appearance, its stats, the resources you need, and the progress you need to make throughout the game in order to get all those resources to begin with, even something as simple as getting a chow of a specific color or tone could see you jumping through a lot of hoops. But before we can get into any of that, we need to get into what chow even are to begin with. Chow are introduced in the original Sonic Adventure, and they kinda just exist. They're introduced alongside Chaos as part of Sonic Adventure's main story, but the most background we get on both of them is just that they come from the Chaos Emeralds. Or more accurately, the energy harvested by the Chaos Emeralds. Chaos appears to be just a Chow as well, just an especially ancient Chow that seems to have manifested directly from the Master Emerald, as opposed to your typical Chow which hatches from an egg. I would assume the eggs just manifest from that same Chaos energy, and since the Master Emerald uses the Chaos Emeralds to derive that energy from all living things on the planet anyway, I guess that would explain why Chow can have a variety of alignments and personalities. We can make our assumptions based on everything we've learned up to this point about the Chaos Emeralds or even just Chaos Energy itself, but the only thing we really know for sure is that Chow are just living incarnations of the energy stored within the Chaos Emeralds. Now as to how all of this plays into you actually raising your Chow, it doesn't. But the question of what Chow are is so big with so many answers, it's important to just start with as much information as possible. Because mechanically speaking, Chow are this. That is to say, Chow are a series of individual values and stats, both seen and unseen, that determine everything from its overall personality, its current mood and behaviors, up to things like evolution, stat ratings, and even death and reincarnation. Some of these stats are more important than others, depending on your end goal, but they're all integral to making your Chow seem alive and unique. The main stats you're bound to care about, because they're the only ones the game actually shows you, are your Chow's active stats. That is, the stats used in Chow races as well as karate. These are your swim, fly, run, power, and stamina stats, each with its own letter grade, level, rating, and progress bar. A stat's rating represents its actual effective value, which itself is dependent on both that level and grade. Basically, the higher your letter grade, the more your stat rating increases with each level up. You fill these meters then by supplementing your chow with either animals or chaos drives that you find in stages, with the exception of your stamina stat, which will only grow by feeding your chow actual fruit or some of the big mushrooms that you can find in the black market. Feeding your chow does a lot more than just raising its stamina stat too. Feeding not only mitigates hunger, which plays a large role in your chow's active mood and behavior, but it also influences two of your chow's most important hidden stats, lifespan and magnitude. If you've raised multiple chow to the point of death or reincarnation, then you might have noticed that some get there a little quicker than others, and that lifespan stat is the reason why. Basically, when a chow egg is generated, all the information relevant to its physical appearance, its stat grades, as well as certain hidden values will be generated at that same time. So you have effectively no control over whether your chow generates with a short lifespan or a long lifespan, but like I said, your lifespan is one of the stats that is actually influenced by feeding your chow. To be specific, every bite of food your chow takes increases their lifespan by a little bit, but only as a child. See, while chow age with the passage of time regardless, they don't actually begin to die until after they've evolved. So the more you feed your chow as a baby, the longer it will live as an adult. What's funny about that is if you've already watched our guides on faster evolution and things like that, you know that you can actually force feed your chow to evolve it faster which effectively means you're starting the countdown to its death faster. And the reason why that works has to do with that other hidden stat we talked about called magnitude. It should be noted that magnitude is just a fan term, it's not official like the other ones, but nonetheless it is a very real stat just like the others. Magnitude then refers to the threshold of minutes passed, or I guess calories consumed from fruit, at least I assume that's the logic that is necessary in order for your chow to evolve. Which is just an overly technical way of saying that after enough time or food, your chow will evolve. 
feeding was probably incorporated into the whole magnitude mechanic so that the randomly generated lifespans wouldn't become redundant with force feeding. Say for example you have a child that is born with an exceptionally low lifespan. Even if you feed it excessively as a child to increase that lifespan, you will also increase its magnitude, forcing it to evolve earlier and forcing its countdown to death to start earlier as well. So you lose effectively what you gain. So whether you force feed or just wait for the natural evolution with your chow, you can expect your chow to live the same amount of hours regardless of its lifespan. So that's a lot to take in already. And we haven't even gotten into the active task of actually raising a chow yet. In particular, it's all important to the amount of time that it takes to reincarnate your chow, which is all necessary to evolving your chow into a chaos chow, which is ultimately what most people go for with the chow garden. While we're on the subject of Chaos Chow and Hidden Values, we need to talk about happiness as it is probably the single most important hidden value for a Chow. A high happiness stat is the key to your Chow reincarnating, which is necessary for it to evolve into a Chaos Chow, which that process itself requires an even higher happiness stat than reincarnation does. Happiness, like the rest of these hidden values, will range from negative 100 up to 100, with zero being just the ground neutral middle. Anything under zero and your chow is unhappy, anything over zero and they are happy. Specifically, you want them at over 30 happiness for Sonic Adventure for them to reincarnate or 50 happiness in Sonic Adventure 2, with a whopping 80 happiness rating being necessary for the actual final Chaos Chow evolution. The good news is that the stat itself is not very hard to augment. As long as you don't abuse your chow, it should never fall below zero, and raising it is as simple as just petting it, picking it up, and giving it plenty to eat. If you do these things only as needed, your chow probably won't have a high enough happiness value to reincarnate, but this can be easily mitigated with just a few pets even at the end of its life. As we went over in both our reincarnation guide and our chaos chow guide, even if your chow detests you completely and just wants to die, you can always leave the area to stop the process and then just come back and hit them with a little bit of gaslighting until they like you enough to reincarnate. So now you know all about these hidden values and how they play into evolving your chow and keeping them from dying. So all that's left is the actual raising of your chow. The actual process of which, depending on your own end goal, could take anywhere from an hour or two to multiple real world days. If you want a more casual experience akin to just raising a digital pet, then you can largely ignore all of the intricate details of raising chow, and you can just stick to feeding them, giving them animals, and then aligning them one way or the other with either the right fruit or the right character depending on whether you're playing Sonic Adventure DX or Sonic Adventure 2 Battle. We are playing on the GameCube by the way if you couldn't tell by the footage. But if what you want is to go down a more, let's call it competitive or collectible route, you're just gonna have to bite the bullet and make the time commitment because there's literally no other way to do it. So with the whole experience being mostly a waiting game, it all boils down to exactly how much you want to get out of the chow garden. If you just want to do the thing and say you have a chaos chow and say you have an all s rank chow or whatever you want to do, then you can get away with a more passive role. That is to say doing the bare minimum requirements while mostly just standing there with the console running. But if you're like me, and you want a wide variety of colorful chow that are all high grade and fully evolved, then you will need to take a blatantly active role. The process is largely the same whether you have an active chow garden or a passive chow garden, with the only real difference being the frequency at which you're doing all of these things. No matter which type of chow garden you choose to have, you will start with the exact same resources across both titles regardless. Every garden generates with two eggs, each of which containing what you would call a regular two-tone chow, otherwise known as just a normal chow. Two-tone refers to the fact that it has literally two tones on its body, the blue tone and the yellow tone, and the regular is in reference to its actual color. So it's not blue, it's regular. It starts as that blue and yellow color, but it changes with alignment or attribute. This is why your chow turns white if it's aligned with the good guys, or black if it's aligned with the bad guys. Which is like mad racist, but that's not what this video is about. Anyway, all of this stuff is important because if you want a very specific looking chow, you're gonna need to know all of the things that go into the look. Not only the color and tone, but also whether it's shiny or non-shiny, or whether it's something called a jewel chow. 
which is what the gold and silver chow found in Sonic Adventure DX's overworld are. Say for instance you want a shiny green two-tone devil chow, you need all of those qualities isolated and bred onto chow until you get the exact combination you want. The only two-tone chow you get are from regular eggs, and they of course only come in the one color variety, with shininess being a completely separate factor. Now it is possible to get shiny colored eggs from the black market once you have enough emblems, but all of the colored eggs that you get from the black market will always be monotone. You will never get a two-tone chow. Like I said, the only way to get two-tone chow are from the regular eggs that generate in the gardens initially. So ideally you would want to breed a shiny green chow with one of those regular two-tones that you had from the beginning, but chow inheritance unfortunately is not as simple as one plus one equals two. All of those potential appearance factors that we just went over exist on a dominant and recessive system. So technically all of your chow have two colors and two tones and two shiny or jewel values. One being dominant and the other being recessive. So the regular two-tone that you get in the beginning, for example, is actually a regular, regular two-tone, two-tone. This is important then because if you breed two chow that are completely different, the resulting egg could potentially inherit attributes that aren't actually apparent. So even if the resulting chow comes out looking exactly like one of the parents, it could still have recessive traits from the other one that could potentially be passed on through later breeding. So if you've ever bred a green and an orange chow together and gotten a plain white baby out of it, that's the reason why. Either way, it doesn't even matter. The only thing that matters is that you understand how inheritance affects a chow's appearance and you're ready to actually breed your chow and raise it up to its competitive level, right? No. Wrong. We haven't even gotten into how inheritance and evolution affects those active stats we talked about earlier, you know, your power and your run and all that. It's not enough to just have the right colors that you want to inherit. If you have nothing but low-grade stats for your chow to inherit, you're still basically starting it at zero. You could get lucky and hatch one of your chow and have it just have stellar stats, but odds are they're gonna be pretty average or more than likely below average. You can thankfully alter stat grades though. It's as simple as evolving your chow into the corresponding evolution type, so you'd evolve your chow into a running type if you wanted to rank up its run stat into a swim type for its swim stat, so on and so forth. But since you can only fully evolve once per life cycle, getting a stat all the way up from say an E to an S would take five life cycles in and of itself. And that's not even including all the other stats. So the smarter, more efficient way to do it then would be to evolve and rank up the two highest different stats on each of your chow and hope that the resulting offspring inherits both of those letter grades alongside whatever physical aspects you wanted from those chow as well. Chow inheritance does work largely to the player's favor in that chow are always more likely to inherit a parent's stats than to generate a new random one. And in the event that they do inherit one of the parent's stats, they're also more likely than not to inherit the higher stat as opposed to the lower stat. You can still get a full set of randomly generated gutter stats, or you can just get flat out the wrong color combination or some combination of both of those things. So you could find yourself, even with just one pair of chow, breeding for an extended period of time as you try to get the right combination of inheritable traits. To that end, we can make the overall process a little bit easier and a little less time consuming by exploiting some of Sonic Adventure's more sloppy mechanics. A Chow's willingness to mate is yet another hidden value among all the other ones that we mentioned earlier. It naturally, gradually builds up over time, but it's a very slow process, and more than likely your Chow will only ever naturally go into its mating season once per life cycle. But through the use of the heart fruit which you can buy from the black market, we can maximize a Chow's willingness to breed pretty much as soon as it evolves. Which of course Chow do need to be evolved in order to breed. But again, you want to evolve your chow regardless so that you can rank up those stats. The problem that the heart fruit presents us with now is that we have to actively buy it, which means we need money. There are ways to farm rings very quickly and very easily, but all you really need is the two heart fruit. Like I said before, all of the chow's letter grades and miscellaneous values are generated at the same time that the egg is. So once you have your egg, the chow is what it is no matter what. But instead of going out and buying two more heart fruit and doing the whole process over again, what you can do is feed your desired chow the heart fruit, and once they go into their mating season, you can save and exit the chow garden. Chow garden data saves separately from the main Sonic Adventure data, 
and that save data does include your Chao's current mood and personality values. So if you save while you have two Chao whose willingness to mate is maxed out, the next time you spawn into that garden they will both be effectively ready to breed. So you can get your egg and if it's not exactly what you want, you can just reset the game. Just make sure you don't save because then you will have to buy two more heart fruit and start over again. You want to repeat this process until you get Chao that are mostly B and A grade. From there you'll have more than likely desirable physical traits that you want as well as a good gene pool for new eggs and new Chao to inherit their stats from. Optimally, if you can manage the resources, you want to breed at least a few pairs of Chao at a time, with each pair being as varied as possible from the next. If you can keep this pace up for a couple of hours, doing absolutely nothing but farming rings and breeding Chao, you'll be pumping out multiple S ranks in no time. Going back to those sloppy Sonic mechanics we were just talking about too, your ring count within the black market acts sort of strangely as well. Rings are used as a form of currency within the Chow Garden, but you can't actually find them in the Chow Garden. They have to be found in the actual game of Sonic Adventure or Sonic Adventure 2. So whatever rings you collect in a stage gets saved and translate to your active total ring count within the Chow Garden. In Sonic Adventure 2 Battle on the GameCube specifically, something about the way that the game stores this data in between the main game and the Chow Garden makes it possible to augment your ring count by the act of selling things within the Chow Garden without actually finalizing your ring count. It seems that your ring total is actually only saved at the very end of stages or when you leave a Chow Garden. So your ring count within the Chow Garden then seems to be only temporarily stored in the same way that your ring count during an active stage is. Unlike your ring count in a stage, if you were to reset the Chow Garden, which you normally wouldn't be able to do, that ring total will remain without having finalized because you never saved. The only way to do this then would be to soft reset by either hitting the actual physical reset button on your GameCube or by doing the XB start command on your GameCube controller. This means you can sell everything in your Chow Gardens for extra rings, reset it without saving, and then do it over and over and over again, finally resetting and then saving without selling your stuff to keep that new higher ring total. Which makes the act of buying rare eggs for shininess or for special colors much easier and much faster. And that brings us to our final hurdle, which is the playing of Sonic Adventure itself. Chow are basically your incentive to replay the game to begin with. Replaying more stages means more rings to buy shiny eggs and cool things with, and more importantly it means more emblems to unlock rarer goods in the black market. Thankfully just playing the main story in either game usually yields you enough emblems to start seeing rare, colorful, or shiny eggs anyway, so that's not too big of a deal. And hopefully by that point you've already raised a few high-grade chow that can breed with the new colors and just give you new high-grade colorful babies. Once you've got your stats and once you've got the color combinations that you want, the only thing left to do is to max out the actual levels of those stats to get the most out of them possible. Just like we can exploit the game's mechanics to speed up the mating process, we can similarly speed up the leveling process significantly. Normally to increase a stat's progress, you would feed Chao animals or chaos drives that correspond to the stat. Some are more effective than others, but at a maximum of 10 animals or chaos drive in your inventory every time you go back to the Chao Garden, giving your Chao enough of anything to level up any one of its stats, let alone all of it, can take a very long time. So instead of running through the same stages over and over again for the rare animals, you're better off just repeating the ones that you already have. Chow are just as buggy as everything else in Sonic Adventure, and one of the things that's kind of messed up with them is their proximity. The cocoon that Chow go into whenever they evolve or die or reincarnate seems to be actually always active. If you've ever stood next to your Chow and it seems like you were getting pushed away from them for some reason, it's because you were actually standing inside that intangible, transparent cocoon. Another curious little trait of this is that if you put an animal or a chaos drive or even some fruit within the proximity of that cocoon, your chow will engage with it as if you had handed it to it directly. If done properly, you can set an animal in front of your chow close enough that it will engage with it, but it won't actually consume it. It will adopt its stats as if it had consumed it, but the animal will still remain as untouched or unused allowing you to pick it back up and do the same thing over and over and over again until you max out any given stat. This glitch is equally helpful when it comes to evolving multiple Chaos Chow at once. That way you can just use the same animals over and over again instead of having to do the whole 21 animal hunt for each Chaos Chow you want to evolve. A quick little refresher on Chaos Chow. In order to evolve into one, your Chow needs to have reincarnated at least twice, and then on that third life, 
it needs to get one of each animal in its childhood, and then it needs to evolve into a neutral type, and that gets you a Chaos Child. Like everything else with Child, there are optimal ways to doing this as quickly and as effectively as possible, but because it is very easy to lose track of what you're doing, especially in those last few steps and mess up the Chaos Child process, I find it easier to just go stage by stage getting groups of animals that are different and then hunting down the last few one by one. That way I know that I got whole stages of animals and I don't have to be as careful when I'm getting the rest of them. One more very important thing, if you are going to be evolving your Chow into a Chaos Chow, as I just mentioned, evolving into a Chaos Chow means evolving into a neutral type after having reincarnated at least twice. So technically, because your Chow can't die or reincarnate unless it has evolved, Reincarnating twice and then evolving into a Chaos Chow means that it takes three evolutions minimum for your Chow to evolve into a Chaos Chow. You want to keep this in mind because three evolutions means three opportunities to raise your stat grades. Chaos Chow will always require the neutral evolution at the end, but either way, if you get a Chow with a couple of stat grades that are less than perfect, you can just spend the Chow's first couple of life cycles evolving it and ranking those up to that S grade. One major side note, if you're playing Sonic Adventure as opposed to Sonic Adventure 2, you won't actually be able to see your stat grades anywhere. If you have a Game Boy Advance with a link cable, however, you can always just transfer the eggs that you get from Sonic Adventure through the Tiny Chow Garden to Sonic Adventure 2. The Tiny Chow Garden as well is actually the key to some of the rarer eggs that you can find in the Chow Garden, specifically the jewel eggs that we mentioned. The gold and silver eggs can just be found in Sonic Adventure's overworld, but the ruby, sapphire, emerald, and all other jewel chow are only available through the black market within the tiny chow garden. As if the fact that you needed a whole separate console and accessory wasn't bad enough, the jewel eggs are easily the most expensive chow eggs, and the rate at which you generate rings within the tiny chow garden is just ridiculous. Even playing the one game repeatedly without any mistakes, because I can basically cheat using my capture setup, it took well over an hour for me to save up enough rings to buy the Sapphire Egg, which isn't even half as expensive as the most expensive Jewel Egg, being the Onyx Egg at 20,000 rings. Aside from being able to transfer the gold and silver Chow that you get from Sonic Adventure's Overworld, there's also a black Chow Egg. It's not exactly as rare as the Jewel Eggs, given the fact that you can buy black eggs and even shiny black eggs from the black market in either Sonic Adventure game, but this just lets you save the massive amount of time that it can take to get all the emblems necessary for those eggs to start showing up. But again, by that point, you should have the stats that you want, so it's really just a matter of getting the new colors. So what is the point then of doing all this other than just looking pretty? The only real thing to do with your Chow is to participate in races with them. Or if you're playing Sonic Adventure 2, you can also participate in Chow Karate. These modes are passive as well. You're basically just spectating your Chow. Though you can cheer them on, which will affect certain stats depending on what you're doing. You can boost your Chow's spirits if they're losing in Karate. And in a race, you can press the A button to cheer them on and have them use more stamina to run faster. But honestly, if you already went through the trouble of getting a full S grade, level 99 Chow, you have nothing to worry about. To that end, you may want to consider evolving into a neutral Chaos Chow, or a Light Chow as they call it. Because with the races at least, there are a couple of exclusive categories for Dark and Hero Aligned Chow. Neutral Aligned Chow can participate in either one, but Dark Chow can only participate in Dark Races, and Hero Chow can only participate in Hero Races. Winning races is how your Chow get toys and accessories, by the way and they will also get little medallions based on what race they just won. And these things are cool because they'll even show up on Chaos Chow, which normally can't have their appearance augmented at all. You also get emblems for participating in races and karate, so if you're going for the full 180, if you want all the unlockables, Green Hill Zone and all of that, then this will just give you a much easier time of it overall. No, yeah, but once you're done, the most you can do is just keep breeding more unique Chow, but that's of course if you even care about having multiple Chow. There are other slight differences even if you get some repeat colors, for example their facial expressions and their nature. Some people claim that there are no ways to influence these things, but all of my chow tend to have the same mischievous kind of expression and I hatch all of my eggs the same way. Yeah! A few more tips that you want to keep in mind as we close out the video. You don't actually need max stats to get all of the emblems. Some of the later races and such will be a little more challenging, but if your Chow's appropriate stats are somewhere around the 2000 mark, that's about as high as they need to be for you to win all of the races, it seems. Stamina, as mentioned, can only be increased with food, not animals or chaos drives. 
so you may consider just using Chao fruit for leveling up, as each full fruit will give your Chao not only 5 stamina points, but 5 points in every other stat as well. And probably my most useful tip, since Chao aren't able to queue up any sort of action while they're in the water, you can find certain spots within these bodies of water in which you can wedge your Chao in between the wall and yourself, keeping them from being able to move, meaning they'll never be able to get out of the water to eat or evolve or even die or reincarnate or anything. This is particularly helpful in those instances where you want to age a Chao overnight and don't want to worry about it accidentally dying while you're asleep. So again, no matter what the process is going to take hours upon hours to do properly, so if you want the most out of your time investment, you're gonna want to breed multiple Chao. Like I said, if you can offset the birth and evolution of these Chao by a couple of hours each, you'll find yourself in a situation where every couple of hours a different Chao is either ready to reincarnate or evolve, which means between feeding and petting and everything else, you'll always have something to actively do within the Chao Garden. But again, if you don't care about all those intricate tiny details, and you want to just take a more passive role about it, then you can just throw your Chao in the pool, throw on something to watch, for example, one of our many gameplay series, and just forget about it until it's time to reincarnate. You can play the actual game in between too, just don't forget that time won't pass in the Chao Garden unless you're actively in there. And that is true for each of the gardens. So if you spend all of your time in the Hero Garden or in the Dark Garden, the Chao in the other ones will never age either, which is probably what you want. At least that's the way I do it. I keep all the complete chaos ones in the normal garden, I keep the ones that I'm actively raising in the dark garden, and then I keep the babies that I'm going to raise in the future in the hero garden. If you want more insight as to how you can do things like prevent death or change evolution at the last minute, you should also check out the guides that we have related to those subjects, which are all much shorter and much quicker to get to the point. This video is informative in and of itself, but it's more just outlining the entire experience for what it is, which is why it's such a long-winded video. Anyway, as always, thank you for your continued viewership, especially if you're still watching up to this point. Thank you for liking and sharing and anything else. All of that, of course, helps performance, it helps the analytics, and makes it more likely that you'll see me out there in the world more often. The world of YouTube, that is. So keep watching, keep clicking on things. Thank you one final time, and I still don't know how to end videos.